Hi everyone, it's Joe. You're listening to Occupational Hazards, a series of candid conversations with some of the most inspiring people I know as they share their path to finding their calling and all the gritty realities of their jobs. Whether you want to demystify your dream job or are someone like me who enjoys getting a peek into other people's work lives, then this is the podcast for you. Some people have sent us messages asking if we can make some of the episodes shorter. Your wish is our command. We've released a shorter episode. We call this our coffee break episode. For this episode, we're playing an excerpt. We featured a guest uh, named Joaquin Valdez on episode seven of the pod. He's an actor and a former director, boy band member slash professional musician all-around performer who decided to give up his career in the Philippines and go to the UK to pursue acting on a global stage. One of the highlights of his episode, we got a lot of mail about this, was Joaquin has been doing a side project about the Filipino accent. So it's an exploration of the Filipino accent and how it's depicted on the global stage and in media. So here's Joaquin talking about his accent project. My agent, she suggests to me that I learn different UK accents so that I can have more opportunities inside the room, right? And I did that. And I realized the more I'm studying all of these different English accents or, or UK accents, that my own accent becomes a little bit more different and more... I, I, I'm, a, I'm very aware of how different my sound is and how different my accent is. And I started to research. Um, I started to research and discover the origins of my accent and my sound. And I realized that my sound, whatever it is, some people call it American, some people call it Latino, some people call it Irish, but they can never really place exactly what it is because I don't sound American to an American, nor do I sound Latin to a, a Latino. So what is my accent? And I realized that it's just really one part of the very colorful gradiated spectrum of the larger Filipino accent. So I go into a deep dive into understanding why, who, why, where, how did I get this sound? And that unearthed so much research and so much information about status, about history, about geography, about the 187 languages we speak in the archipelago about really not having a very solid understanding of what the national language is and how it's written in the constitution as well. The diaspora and how people migrate different, of different statuses from the Philippines, how they migrated and generation. Um, the accent of someone who migrated to the States in the eighties is very different from someone who migrated last year to the United Kingdom, you know? So all of these things influence the sound and I realized that I wanted to remove the stereotype of this Filipino accent as we only see it as punchlines in what is becoming more mainstream with stand-up comedians like Joe Coy. Uh, there's a whole Crazy Ex-Girlfriend feature on, on the Filipino family. You have Nico Santos, who's doing an amazing job in Superstore representing the Filipino and the Filipino migrant. So there's so much more interest in the Filipino character written for film, TV, and stage. And I feel that there is not enough discussion on what the Filipino accent is. Everybody has an idea, a very vague idea of what it is. And when they are meant to mimic it or to try it out, they refer to how their mom sounds or their dad sounds or their tita sounds or their family in the Philippines sounds. But they don't really have an understanding of the complexities and the dimensions of it. And my goal with this research is to break away from that very stereotypical and punchline level understanding of the accent. And there is a place for that. I love comedy. And there is a, there's a reason for why there's a stereotype. But then there's also a world of understanding to discover about the other dimensions that affect this Filipino sound. And... I think later on, I mean, I'm receiving more casting calls out here for films and TV, wherein they're looking for Filipino characters with a Filipino accent. 
So I'm not even sure if the producers and the casters understand what they're asking for when they say they want the Filipino accent. You know, can I come in there with an Ilocano accent or a Hiligaynon accent or a <laughs> You know what I mean? I don't think they know. They just have, they, we want the Filipino with a Filipino accent. But what's great about that is there's more stories now and characters being written, right? So my research is kind of just riding on that anticipation that eventually, because of just our history of migration, that there will be more Filipino characters written into mainstream media. And there will be Filipino actors that will need to understand the complexities of this accent so that we're not just going back to this stereotype or this, this or trope. Cartoonish portrayal. I, I, absolutely, of this cartoonish portrayal. And I like it. I mean, the workshop has been received so well and the reactions have been emotional to say the least. Because after I run through a very lengthy lecture on the factors that affect this sound. And I don't go straight into the application. I have to make them sit through this important discussion on the factors that affect it because it's about status. It's about privilege. It's about history. It's about our poverty. It's about colonialism. It's about our history with the Western colonizers. It's all of that rolled into one, into one lengthy discussion. And then I apply it and I make the participants, which are actors, I make them choose a speech from Shakespeare, a classical speech that any actor would have as an audition piece, but use the Filipino accent in it. And it's emotional because they've never taken the Filipino accent seriously, or they've never legitimized this sound in such a serious and legitimate context. And it's a nice journey because as they start the speech, it's almost like they're embarrassed to use the accent. But then they finish the speech empowered by it. And I love how it's opening up a discussion for Filipino actors who were never in the Philippines, because there's so many of them in the States and here in the UK, and also for Filipino migrant actors who have tried to shy away from their own accent to compete with the Brits and the Americans. Because we, we come out, and it's the same feeling I had when I came out to the UK, I felt automatically inferior or, you know, not worthy or not enough. And embracing your own sound, embracing your own accent does so much to you as an actor and as a storyteller. And hopefully this will open up more opportunities for Filipino characters to be written so that our representation in mainstream films and TV and stages is more rounded. And we're not just reduced to a background nurse, a helper, or, you know, a dishwasher. Hopefully, front and center, we have Filipino characters. Yeah. Well, the Filipino nurses in the UK are, like, doing the lion's share uh, of COVID care. And, yeah. yeah. So it would be interesting to see them get the full and uh, fully rounded portrayal if there were to be stories right. written about them. Right. Are you all caught up? So that was Joaquin talking about his accent project. Now we have Jen. Like I said, she's a logo designer of this pod, and she's going to help me read some listener feedback from two listeners in particular who had interesting things to say about how the exploration of the Filipino accent has played into their work as well. So we have a friend of the pod, author Mina Villasguerra, who is actually a romance writer. She tweeted that she listened to our episode. You can see the screenshots on our Instagram, but if you follow her on Twitter, you'll actually see this thread. Her handle is at Mina Villasguerra. So she said that she listened to the pod and she said Joaquin and I had talked about studying the Filipino accent as it's portrayed or used in, you know, film, media, and theater. So she talked about sliding into my DMs, uh, which she did. Thanks, Mina to tell me that these issues around the portrayal of the Filipino accent as a stereotype or maybe not such a nuanced portrayal also happen in the world of audiobooks. She said there's, I'm going to quote her now, there's a lot of unexamined stuff regarding accents given to Filipinos or Filipino characters in audiobooks or work by Filipino writers, right? So she's producing her own audiobooks and actually having conversations with global producers about what actors to cast, what type of choices to make in telling a story. 
Jen, do you want to talk about what she says about the accents as she's explaining it to the people she collaborates with? Sure. So, and like they mentioned, it is absolutely determined by region and class and generation and school attended and other languages spoken and a whole host of things. I hope people realize that many audiobooks don't portray our accents in language very well. Every time I encounter it, I tell myself, it's just one book. What does it matter? They probably know that those are choices the performer and producer made or let slide, right? Until I'm told that when I speak, I don't sound Filipino. Really, what makes you say that? Am I now being judged on how I sound based on media where the same choices are not examined again and again until it's the standard because of things like massive distribution? And people like me are now the outliers who have to explain why we sound like that? Messed up, right? Basically, what Mina is saying is because in the past there were not more intentional choices made regarding accents or the people casting and producing these audiobooks just made assumptions about what a Filipino should sound like. Either they cast somebody who is maybe of Filipino descent but has an American accent for a character that's set in the Philippines, which wouldn't necessarily, again, depending on various factors like background, where they live, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. But it's easier for them to cast somebody if the studio is in America. It's easier for them to do that casting or to just cast characters but then play the Filipino accent off for laughs. So there definitely should be more nuanced portrayals, especially as more Filipino creators start making work. Uh, and I think this is true for not just Filipinos, but any person of color or any underrepresented minority on the global stage who is now making work available and challenging the notions of what people think those characters based in a certain place should sound like. We can actually talk about productions like Trece, where if you guys haven't seen it, it's an animated series on Netflix. One of my favorite Pinoy graphic novels. It's a crime procedural featuring supernatural elements from Filipino mythology. It's set in the Philippines. And there were some interesting choices made regarding voice actors, both for the English language version. So they cast mostly Filipino-American and Filipino-Canadian actors for the main cast. And for the Tagalog or the Filipino dubbed version, they cast uh, more, I think, of our local voice actors and some Filipino celebrities based in the Philippines. In the English dub, when, for instance, commuters are getting off the train and complaining about the train breaking down in the opening scene in the first episode, they're actually speaking English with a Filipino accent. So that got praise for being authentic. Some of the more questionable or controversial casting choices have to do with why some of the main characters who are supposed to be born and raised in the Philippines, in the English dub, actually sound Latino. There was a question as to why did they cast actors who are trying to sound Filipino and end up sounding like Latino or Mexican instead of getting Filipinos who could actually do the accent. So there were some questions about that. And there's, a, again, a variety of reasons. I also understand why some of those casting choices are made. There is a Japanese dub too. I, I can't speak about what the accents were like because I don't speak Japanese. Jen, did you listen to the Trese dub in Japanese? I watched the trailer. I haven't seen the actual dubbed episodes yet, but I think that would be really interesting. I think one thing that I really liked was that they kept all the spells and incantations in Filipino just to, I guess, retain that local flavor. And in the trailer, I thought it was really funny. You know, it's all in Japanese, but then they say, they Babaylan us, mandirigma. Yes. Babaylan mandirigma. Yeah, in like a Japanese accent. So I thought that was really cute. Okay, so that was the comment about Trese. So we have another friend of the pod, Dr. Ron Darwin, at ron.darwin on Instagram, but you can follow his work also on academia.edu. Ron referred us to a website called www.dialectsarchive.com. That's dialects, plural, and archive, singular. So dialectsarchive.com. And he said, I think it's useful so one doesn't end up essentializing or exoticizing Filipino accents, which is, I think, a more eloquent and concise way of trying to say what we were saying earlier about choices people make when portraying the accent in film. I basically told him that he, as an academic, Joaquin as an actor, and Mina as an author, who all talk about this topic, are like the Avengers of representation. Ron, uh, Professor Darwin, 
Dr. Darwin, published a journal article, which we'll link to in the show notes, about social class and the inequality of English speakers in a globalized world. So Ron basically talks about ELF. That's not Will Ferrell, but it's English as lingua franca. It's basically the use of English as a global means of communication or any use of English among speakers of different languages for whom English is the communication medium of choice and often the only option. Or lingua franca means a language adopted as a common language between speakers whose native languages are all different. So it's also called a bridge language, a trade language, because, you know, that's how people conduct business bridge language because it's bridging two different backgrounds. So yeah, English has become the lingua franca because of just the, some people would say cultural imperialism or actual imperialism, if you go back to the British empire. So the cultural imperialism of America and the actual imperialism of both the US and the British empire, but that's totally separate discussion. Listen to Nicole's podcast episode two, if you're interested in that topic. His paper, it's kind of a reaction to observations in ELF research that Anglophone or English speaking centric attitudes toward English are actually eroding among speakers of a younger generation. Well, Ron was trying to show that actually the attitudes towards English of younger generations who don't have it as a first language, you know, who are using it as a lingua franca actually vary depending on the social class background of said young speakers. So he actually looked at a case study of immigrant Filipino adolescents living in Vancouver and tried to examine how the class differences of these different youth impinged on their lived experiences as well as the material conditions of their migration. And it shaped how they negotiated their quote-unquote linguistic capital, particularly their use of English. So things like social class can actually shape how one feels about the language you're speaking, as well as the type of accent you want to adopt. And this is what Joaquin was saying on his episode, that you know many factors will influence the sound. Also what Mino is saying about it has to do with where you're from, where you've studied, the other languages you speak. And if you're a migrant, like when you might have migrated, we had several users who are interested in linguistics. Uh, we're trying to bring them on the pod as well, who are actually talking about their own experiences with, you know, moving around, their accents and their native tongues changing. We had a listener who was Italian, who now conducts 99% of his life in English because he's been living in countries that don't speak Italian. And he said he's now living in the Philippines and he's adopting the Filipino English accent. A uh, note on my own accent on the pod, I'm also very aware. Joaquin talked about being cognizant of his own accent. As I've listened to the playback of the different episodes, I realized that my accent changes depending on the guest I'm interviewing. Maybe in the future, we can do like bilingual pods. We'll see. We can bring on more languages because you guys speak more than just English and Filipino, right? As of today's recording, about 40% of our listeners are actually not in the Philippines. <laughs> Joaquin actually appeared on another podcast recently. There is a publication called End Asian. They did a roundtable talking about Filipino linguistics throughout the diaspora. This is an interview he did fairly recently. Again, he repeated some of the things he said on the episode about how the Filipino accent or the sound should not necessarily be an object of punchlines or an item of othering is the word he used because all the different ways we speak English on these islands are actually valid. Like not everyone sounds like Joaquin, not everyone sounds like me, not everyone's going to sound like, you know, the actors on Trece. Again, there is variety and diversity that's not necessarily being depicted in the mainstream. It's kind of like his joke about how in the UK, there's all these different accents. And based on watching TV, you would just think that everyone is speaking RP or, or received pronunciation or the Queen's English was actually I think only about 3% of the population speak. So think Downton Abbey, The Crown, you know, very like proper, like if you watch a lot of the newscasters as well as the government officials, I think. Anyway, so there's a certain skew or a media skew toward that type of accent. So same with the Filipino accent that kind of shapes what people think people should sound like. 
Anyway, so yeah, Wakin talked about how the accent and the ways in which we speak English are actually all valid. They're a product of our colonial history. They are a product of migration and kind of Filipinos are all over the world now. You have them in the States, the United Kingdom, Europe, Japan, Iraq, and the Middle East, and that they're all part of the story. And this is to quote him. He says, whatever sound they have when they speak English is reflective of that journey. So Joaquin actually talked also about how he got people in his workshops to speak English with a Filipino accent and deliver text. And he alluded to this a bit on our pod, saying that it was a very emotional experience for some people. And then he actually said one of the actors in his workshop said, after he had delivered a scene from King Lear, Shakespeare's King Lear, in English with a Filipino accent, uh, and Joaquin asked him how he felt, and he said, you know, I have successfully othered my father for sounding like this all my life. And after reading the speech, it feels like I've redeemed him. And almost like I've asked for his forgiveness. I thought that was such a beautiful uh, sentiment. But I think this is something that probably resonates not just with Filipinos or Filipino speakers, but anybody who's come from kind of an immigrant background and maybe whose parents or grandparents speak a bit differently from how they speak in the mainstream language in whatever place they are. So this is, I think, a fairly universal experience. So he actually created a video for the Filipino nurses in the NHS or the National Health Service in the UK. Again, as we mentioned on the episode, they are doing the lion's share of COVID care throughout this whole pandemic. So he gathered together some Filipino heritage actors together with a small theater company called New Earth Theater. I think they highlight a lot of multicultural voices as well. So have a look. Um, we'll link to their Instagram in the pod notes as well. But basically, he translated Shakespeare's Sonnet 18, uh, which is famous for starting with, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Probably the most famous love letter of Shakespeare. So Joaquin translated it to Tagalog. And then he had all these other actors speak it in their own different UK or English dialects. So they were speaking the translated version of the poem. So actually, if you listen to the clip later, they're doing it in English, but he overlays it with Tagalog or slash Filipino. Because again, long story, Filipino is a national language, but obviously it borrowed heavily from Tagalog, much to the chagrin of people who spoke other languages around the Philippines, such as Cebuano and Ilocano and, and Kapampangan, and there are questions about like why Tagalog. Totally separate discussion. But anyway, Filipino and Tagalog, for the purposes of this conversation, we'll use them interchangeably. So he translated it to Filipino, and he said that he received some resistance from the actors because they were insecure about the way they spoke Tagalog, you know. So maybe their parents spoke it, they might not have spoken it very well. So he actually had them speak Tagalog or Filipino in all these different British, UK, English dialects. And basically, the experience ended up being the reverse of how a Filipino migrant to the UK would feel about their own English. This poem was the sonnet, the translation of the sonnet and the production of the work around the sonnet was meant first and foremost not to explore the Filipino accent, but to be a thank you to the frontliners. So I would love to have a healthcare professional on the pod. And when the situation clears up, probably will be able to host one. So look forward to that in season two or season three. For now, we don't have a frontliner on the pod, but we will be playing for you Joaquin's Ode to the Filipino Nurses in the British Healthcare System. And I am not in the UK, but I think I speak for many people when I say that this is an ode that could go out to frontliners all over the world, especially in my hometown, the Philippines. If you are a frontliner and you're listening to this, I salute you. Thank you for the work that you've been doing. And yeah, you have the greatest occupational hazards of all, but you keep going. You've managed to give hope and inspiration to so many people. So thank you for all that you do. So here's Joaquin with Shakespeare's Sonnet 18. Shall I May yaambing pa kita sa isang araw ng tag-araw? 
kay di hamak na mas maganda at mas kanais-nais. Magaslaw ang ihip ng kanyang mayong hangin. At ang masaya niyang pagbisita ay madalas na nakabibitin. Minsan, ang maaraw niyang titig ay nakapapaso. At kadalasan, ang kinto ang kutis ay kumukulimlim din. At ang bawat ganda ay panahunang nawawala. Sa kamalasan man o sa kusang paglipas ng tadhana. Ngunit ang iyong tag-araw ay walang hanggan. At ang iyong kagandaan ay walang kawalan. Mismong si kamatayan ay di ka kayang matakbay. Sabagat ika'y sumisikat sa bawat taludturan. Hanggat ang tao ay humihinga o tayo'y nakakakita, ito'y buhay at sa iyo'y nagbibigay buhay ang aking talata. If you like these snippets, you can listen to the rest of the mailbag on the season finale, parts one and two, that's episodes 12 and 13 of the pod. Now go back and listen to the rest of Wilkin's episode if you liked it. If you want us to continue this conversation with Mina and Ron, let us know and we'll try to book them on a future episode. And now, back to the daily grind. Ciao. Thanks for listening, guys. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, and share with a friend so that others can find the pod as well. Do check out at occupationalhazards.podcast on Instagram, where we have more updates from our guests and some listener feedback. Slide into our DMs. We'd love to hear from you. Catch you next episode.